Right, so hi, I'm Derek. I have no introductory slides, so I'll just get jump straight into the subject, um, which is a subject of storing non-scalar data. So non-scalar data is um, more complicated things than just your standard strings, numbers, and booleans. Um, so there, they tend to be arrays, your nested objects, your arrays of objects. It, it tends to be a more natural way how you would store uh, application objects in a database in different ways. And traditionally, people with uh, relational databases, you get to do that with different types of patterns. If any of you have seen AEV or something like that, it's a way of storing a single object with lots of not necessarily defined properties in a relational database. But in the last years, uh, decades maybe even, more and more different types of databases showed up, known as skull databases, uh, as they're called, uh, in which many different flavors uh, exist, uh, with the, in the intention of storing data in a more natural way as it would show up for applications. So that is the non-scalar data that I'm having here. So a few examples here. Um, for example, if any of you have ever written a blog application, I certainly have uh, a long time ago. It's, it's often a common thing that you tag a specific post with multiple tags, right? So in this case, um, the tags that I picked here are from OpenStreetMap data. OpenStreetMap data is, is free data. Each object you see on a map can be tagged with many different tags. But storing this kind of information in a relational database, what you would often do is, well, you have to create an extra table with this to store the tags in that you can then link to your articles. So you're actually storing an array of tags separately from where you usually store your data, which is more complicated than a way of doing it. And then separately, there's uh, examples like you have product, catalog product catalogs. Uh, if you have a product catalog, I always take Amazon's uh, example here. I'm pretty sure not many of you operate of the scale of Amazon here. Um, but of course, those product, product, product catalogs, you can store both books as well as, in my, my example, whiskeys here. Right? Amazon sells whiskeys in the UK. It's very handy. Um, and of course, all these different products will have different properties. Like a whiskey doesn't have a number of pages. It make, make, makes no sense, right? And similarly, a book doesn't have an um, have, um, alcohol percentage, for example, or a um, distillery attached to that necessarily, right? So you have different properties, but it's still part of something that is a product. And traditionally, relational databases don't handle storing their data particularly very well, or unless, uh, yeah, it gets very complicated sometimes. All right, so what is this presentation not about? It's also important. I'm not going to talk about how you s store this data in a scalable way. I'm not going to talk about high availability. I'm not going to go into an in-depth technology covering of all the things I'm mentioning here, because I'll be talking for days and I only have 57 minutes left. And I'm also not talking about benchmarks. So benchmark is always a bit of a tricky point because you can't really benchmark the different nose goal solutions against each other because they are all there to do something very different. So it makes no sense to compare these things together, so I won't be talking about that. All right, so the things that we're going to have a look at in the next 50 minutes or so is uh, we're going to look at the different database types for storing non-scalar data, um, go a little bit into how, what sort of data you can store in these different types and what they're good for. We're then going to have a look at querying, manipulating data, indexes a little bit, and then we have a conclusion at the end, and then some Q&A as well. All right, so different database types. How many database types do you think there are, different database types? Guess, guess. You've heard of relational databases, right? Key value stores. Uh, there's a document data stores. There's XML data stores. There's so many of them out there, right? There's a, an article on Wikipedia, I believe, that lists 57 different types. Now, to be honest, I think they went a little bit too far with that, and I tend to want to group them together in about four different categories, of which I will be talking about three of them, and not talking about relational databases in this presentation. So the simple one is key value stores. Key value stores, what are really good at, they're usually really small, really fast, and all the operations that you can do with these are on the key only. But minor variations, but usually on key only. But what they do allow for often is that 
the values that you store with these keys, they don't have to be simple numbers or strings or booleans or something like that. They allow you to store more rich data as a single value for a specific key. An example that we'll be looking at here is, for example, Redis. Memcache is another variant of this group of databases. Then, um, so diving a little bit deeper into Redis. So in Redis, the keys are binary safe strings. The values on Redis are also binary safe strings, but it's strings between quotes because it does do clever things with numbers. So numbers are also stored as strings, but you can also still do calculations with them. So they're strings, strings. But beyond these, um, it also allows you to store lists and sets and hashes, sorted sets and a whole bunch of other things that are sometimes a lot more natural to how an application deals with the data. So the interaction with this happens through Redis CLI or PRedis PRedis, which is a, um, a, a composer installable uh, library that helps you do these things. Or you can talk to it with Telnet if you really wanted to. Uh, the examples that I've been showing here are with Redis CLI, which is a very simple way of doing it. If you're doing this through a PHP application, you'd be using PRedis slash PRedis. And I've spoken about the normal string. So <coughs> the way how the Redis protocol works is kind of uh, very, very simple. It's a command line interface that you talk to over network connection, except that there's some binary information in here that you can't see because I'm using this through the Redis CLI uh, tool. So the data that comes back is a little bit more rich than just strings, which are the commands that you give it to. So all the commands in Redis start often with a single letter or multiple letters to indicate what type of data we are operating on. So the S in S at stands for set. And a set of data is a collection of data that belongs to a specific key. So what I'm doing in this first example here is that I'm using the key whiskey colon glenfiddich colon tag. That is one single key. Because all operations you do are on a single key, you need to do something clever about being able to store properties of um, objects. So what the key here basically says is that our data type is a whiskey. Our um, unique identifier is glenfiddich-12. And the property that we're storing with this are the tags. So the set name is whiskey colon glenfiddich-12 colon tags. And then the values that we're adding to the set is what we're doing as a second argument here. So in this case, we're tagging that this whiskey is fruity, it has vanilla in it, and if you add another element to the set that's already in there, it will tell you, by using the zero as return, that this element is already there. So a set doesn't allow you to store the same value multiple times, because that won't be a set anymore. Or you can add uh, things to it. Uh, if you want to have spaces in, it, in your names, then you need to also double quotes. Uh, from PHP itself, uh, you interact slightly different with it. They have nice names for all the operators. Uh, I don't have an example of that, though. Yeah. So after adding elements to the sets, you can, of course, do operations against this, trying to figure out whether a tag or an, a, a word, a string, is a member of the set. So if I use the S is member operator, and I'm basically what I'm trying here is, is the whiskey tag with the word PT. And as you can see in the first bit here, we haven't added that, so the return value of this is going to be zero. Uh, as members returns you all the members of the set. So that's all the ones we have set in the first example. So these are Redis sets. It's a, uh, a way of storing this information, and you can then do operations against this data type, and those operations are atomic operations. You don't have to pull the data down. Compare it in your, in your PHP application or all application, uh, modified and then stored back. All those operations are atomic operations, which is important to know because that is how you interact with almost all of the NodeSQL database. You need to figure out the best optimal operations you can do on your data type in order to not run into race conditions and to make optimal storage, um, uh, make use of the, the capabilities of the databases. So Redis sets are a very good way of quickly doing this. Redis usually runs into mem in, in memory, although you can back it up to disk as well and there's ways of doing that, but it's a very quick way of doing this kind of operations. It's really, really fast to do so. Um, similar things, there's also a hash data type. They work like associative arrays in PHP. So H, the first letter here stands now for hash, 
And when you do a hash set, we again we use the key. In this case, it's the props key of the Ben Nevis whiskey. And we say that the distillery associated with this is called Ben Nevis. And then with HM set, M is a letter that often comes after the first letter stands for multi. <coughs> Means we can set multiple values in one go. So in this case, we're setting the properties region, Scotland, Highlands, as well as H19 at the same time. Again, one operation doing multiple things. And then retrieving uh, is also possible by using hgetall. You ask for the properties. And then what you get on the Redis command line script is you get key value, key value, all those different values in your, in your result, which is kind of ugly. Uh, P Redis, P Redis handles that a lot better. And you get actually an associative array back, so that's better. Um, beyond that, you can also retrieve single elements of this hash by using hget. And you can see that even though we set the value as 19 as a number, it still comes back as a string 19. So the strings are a bit tricky here. All right, so that was a quick overview of Redis. It's a very simple way of dealing with very specific data types. But because it is all in memory, it is a really fast way of handling that information. So Redis is often used for either kind of caching information or <coughs> doing on-the-fly calculations of quick things that are always available, and it doesn't particularly matter very much. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> and the intention is that you can always build back this data for more information. Sorry, give me one second. <coughs> this, I, this always happens about five minutes in. Um, Sorry. <coughs> right. So a little bit further than... Um, Ooh, it's got some music going on here. <coughs> <coughs> so a little bit more feature-rich than what um, Redis or key value stores are, are the document data stores. And the document data stores are often feature parity with relational databases. Not always, not in all, all specific cases. But they tend to be built for having a... Um, to be able to run on a distributed uh, network. So I really have to do this, because otherwise it's going to annoy me. <coughs> Please turn off the sound. <laughs> uh, so some humor in there. All right, so the, 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 da the document data stores allow for to store more rich information that you can interact with in many other things than just the key. So it is now possible to do operations on keys and values. You can do searches on values and not just on the keys like you can do with key value stores. Um, often if you see examples of document stores, they are all will show you the data in a JSON format because the JSON format is a slightly richer data type. Um, however, most document, do, most document stores will not actually store the information as JSON on this because it's a text format that you need to parse all the time, which is really inefficient, right? So examples of document stores are, for example, MongoDB or CouchDB or Elasticsearch, and they all pretty much work in the same sort of way, or at least the way how, you can, how your data modeling for these databases works. Of course, uh, things like MongoDB and CouchDB, they are, they're, they're are like, I call it, um, they're, they're databases, right? They're storing data. Elasticsearch has a different aspect to it, where it is really good as a full-text search index. You can also use it as a database, sort of, but it isn't meant for it. I mean, in Elasticsearch, um, your search indexes aren't always necessarily up-to-date immediately, which is something you expect from a database, right? I mean, if you write data and you read data, it should be there immediately um, from, from the same uh, server if you talk to it. Uh, difference between MongoDB and CouchDB are mostly around how you write data to it. Um, MongoDB being single master, CouchDB being multi master. But by having these differences, you get other points of contention in other different ways on how you store data. Or rather, how you distribute this data among multiple nodes. So, although they are all a little bit similar, uh, they're also a little bit different. Again, I can't go into detail between all of it because I'd be talking for days. So I have to focus on one, uh, one database that I was talking about, MongoDB, mostly because I know it the best here. All right, so the first line is a bit controversial at the moment, so I won't talk to that about too much. But uh, MongoDB is, is like any other talk, things I've been talking about. It's something you can use for free. 
uh, it doesn't cost you any money. So the documents are stored as BSIN on disk. So BSIN is a binary way of storing JSON information, except that it has a few additional data types. So there's like a, a date timestamp, for example, or there's binary data, and those data types are something that normally JSON doesn't have. So there's a few extra data types uh, thrown in with that. So the interaction from, from within, uh, say, PHP or any other language you can think of, um, what you do is you build data structures inside the application just like there were normal variables. Um, and then you can transfer those um, through a client, through a PHP extension, like you have the MySQL extension, there's a MongoDB extension or an Elasticsearch extension or things like that. It's the way they will take this information, put it in a different format over the network, and then the database stores it in the, its own format, right? So the documents that you interact with from your application will be as natural PHP objects. You can just say, store this PHP object for me, and it'll get sorted for you. Um, with, I mean, there's always going to be some gotchas in here, of course. But what it does mean is that, of course, in a PHP, if you have an object, a single property can be an array, right? And an array, in a tra traditionally in a relational database, you can't really store an array of values for a specific field. Well, you can do that if you serialize it, PHP serialize it, right? Which I'm sure some of you have done in the past. I know I have. Um, so yeah, the, those documents are richer uh, because they can store these arrays. They can also store arrays of objects or nested objects and so on and so on. Um, MongoDB interact with through a PHP extension called MongoDB. And to make things easier to use, you also use an optional compose installable library called MongoDB slash MongoDB. All right, so some examples here. Um, as I said, most of the examples that you see in online documentation will be with uh, JSON documents. The things that I'm talking about here, how those documents look like, will also apply for CouchDB and Elasticsearch. Virtually no differences in whatsoever. So what are the things in here? What are the important things in here? Well, first of all, you have a unique ID. A unique ID is basically your primary key. If you don't set one yourself, it will automatically generate a complicated number. Uh, we usually advise to use, like, if you have a unique key some already, use it yourself. Don't come up with something new that you don't have to invent. So this underscore ID field is your primary key. Um, but then there are values that have extra things in there. So the words field has four words in it, and they are stored as an array. They're not going to be serialized or anything like that. They really just sort as an array. And similarly, the, the field badges um, is an array, and each element in the array is an object with key value pairs again. This is also data you can just store, and you don't have to worry about this. Uh, and you can even query this directly through the query languages. <coughs> so as an example here, just to look at how simple this insert data is, um, uh, first thing we do is we require the, um, the, the library, the, the compose install library, because it provides a nice interface to it. Um, we define a variable called whiskeys, which we define as we make a connection with MongoDB client, use the DRAM IO database and the whiskey collection. Collection in MongoDB is your table, is equivalent to a table. So the whiskeys variable here is now the table or collection object that we can do operations on, like insert, update, delete, your CRUD operation we can think of. So documents, the basic element that you store, are often either represented in associative arrays, like I've done here, or there are PHP objects. And the driver allows you to map different data types depending on which field to other data types when you're hydrating or dehydrating. Again, can't really go in there because I'm not going to have the time for that. But there's a lot more things possible than just looking these at normal PHP objects or associative arrays. So, but what I'm doing here is that with insert one, I'm inserting a single document, and with insert many, you insert multiple documents. Uh, it isn't that complicated to, to, to make use of this. All right, so I once many NoSQL databases started adding support for these richer data types that I've shown you, but either Redis or the document stores with MongoDB, 
Many relational databases also started adding data types to its, uh, to its functionality to store that kind of extra data because they must have seen, well, lots of people find this useful. Uh, let's add this functionality to relational databases as well. Because, I mean, how many of you have had formal relational database theory in uni at some point? It must be some, yeah. Right. Um, and that is really nice. It has allowed you to make the most optimal database scheme to store in your database, but it isn't always um, the most optimal way of interacting with your data from your application, right? I mean, I'm pretty sure many of you will have taken shortcuts uh, to make data easy to query or easy to store from application or, or to avoid having 20-way joints, all right? I mean, they happen. So these additional data types that I've added are good for storing this un or unstructured data um, that we have seen with both, say, Redis as well as MongoDB. And examples of databases that have done so are, well, MySQL and PostgreSQL. If you go even back, traditionally, IBM DB2 would allow you to store similar things in its XML database, right? I mean, XML database is a whole different can of worms again, but um, I mean, XML is, of course, is a richer data format than just your standard numbers and, and strings. So the examples of this group are MySQL and PostgreSQL. I'll be talking mostly about PostgreSQL here because, in my opinion, it has a slightly better implementation or it allows a little bit more functionality, which makes it a better target for comparing it. All right, so just like Redis, PostgreSQL has actually different types of data types to store different types of data. Uh, primarily, there's HStore, which is your associative array kind of variant. There's JSON and JSONB. So you can see that I haven't highlighted JSON because nobody should ever use this anymore, but it was the first one they added to it. The JSONB variant, the B standing for binary, is an optimized version of storing this information. Um, very similar to the BSIM for MongoDB, for example. And PostgreSQL has a much richer query and index support than MySQL for this data type. I also like that PostgreSQL has also an elephant as a logo, so I prefer to use that. And so how does an HTR look like? Well, basically what you do is you store a JSON document into a single data type. So in order to make use of this, you need to activate the HTR extension, which I'm I have to admit, some of these slides are written maybe half a year ago. This technology in PostgreSQL moves very fast, so I might be slightly outdated here. Um, when I looked at this, you still had to activate the HStore extension. It is quite possible that you don't have to do this anymore now. So with this extension available, we then create a table. We create a table users with a single field called HDoc, and the type of this data type is HStore. This is not something that most people do because at least you'd have a unique primary key and things like that, right? But I tried to make this as easy, example as simple as possible, so I left all these things out. And in the last blob here is I'm inserting into users a disassociative array. But how am I inserting this? As you can see, I'm storing this as a string. Now, I know that's a little bit hard to see somewhere, but there are single, single quotes here. The single quotes here to show that you store this as a string because interactions with a relational database are always going to be through strings. Um, but probably the exception of sending values through prepared queries where they will have the possibility of not using strings. But most interactions, especially from PHP, if you don't do anything with it, any query that will come back from, say, MySQL, the data types will still be strings, right? I mean, PDO does that a little bit better, so there's other things to it, but traditionally you would only get a string back because that was a standard way of interacting through SQL. Now, interestingly, there are a few limitations to what you can do with HTOR. So HTOR, um, is, although you can see that we're storing it as a string and a number, uh, it basically stores it as a string anyway. So it is, you can't really do operations on these values. You can't, for example, increment the number by one for a count if you view or add, uh, yeah, or log in an extra time. You can't just simply bump that number. 
Um, but it will have things like strings and booleans and numbers in that. So what PostgreSQL wants to do with HDR is, well, this is some extra information that we can tag to things that we're already storing in the database. So as an example, I was talking a little bit about OpenStreetMap and storing tags with it, right? Because in OpenStreetMap, the data model is like, well, everything has a type, which is either a node or a way or a relation. It has an ID, a, a number from one to four and a half billion or whatever the number is at the moment. And then it has tags that you can just cook up yourself. Um, there is a standard set of tags that people agree with to using, because if you have a road, well, you need to know what type of road it is and what its name is. And people need to agree on what the names for these tags are, otherwise you can't make a nice map out of it, right? But as other, other people uh, then added information for, uh, say, cycling infrastructure on these roads. So they came up with a scheme to add additional tags to put an addition to this object, to this road, for this information. And nothing stops any other user from adding additional information to it with the own tag schemes that I come up with. Now, if you want to draw maps out of this, um, the way how this usually works is you do a query, and then with this information, uh, either you search for roads or you search for cycling infrastructure, you can then draw something. But because the amount of tags that a specific object can have is unbound and upfront undefined, how are you going to index all that information, right? I mean, you can't really clear, create a column for every single tag that you come up with because you end up having hundreds of thousands of columns. Uh, databases don't handle that. Right. There's no database I know that can handle that. But what you can do is for the tags that are not necessarily agreed upon, you can still chuck them in an H store because you can still query against this to do your map drawing without having to create a column for every single tag that you come up with. So the, uh, an H store is really good for handling this kind of, uh, of data storage where you have a, a common set of information that everybody agrees on and then a whole bunch of other things that you don't. So the, the querying against an H store is not going to be as fast as doing an index query against a normal field value combination, but it's still possible to do. And you can also, if you retrieve this uh, field back in your application, then you can do other things for this, like render the information in this HTOR without um, too much complications. So HTOR is used in OpenStreetMap project uh, to do this kind of stuff. The other data type that people use with PostgreSQL is the JSONB data type. And the JSONB data type is very similar uh, how you can interact with that as what well, document data stores like MongoDB and Couchdb and Elasticsearch do. Uh, and it can be, uh, you can create indexes on it. Um, unlike MySQL's JSON type or PostgreSQL's JSON type, uh, the indexes you can set on it are very different from what you would normally do on um, relational database uh, data. Like, uh, you don't really set things up like unique indexes or an index on a specific field or compound field. You set them on a specific data type, and there's different indexes. I'll get back to that in a moment. So a JSONB data type supports richer data types than the values compared to HDOR because an HDOR is just really key value, and the values can't be things like arrays or nested objects. Whereas with the JSONB data type, you can store that information. So again, let's have a look um, at how that looks like. So instead of HTOR, we're using the JSONB data type. And in there, we now insert a string, which is a JSON document. And it's formatted according exactly to JSON. Basically, what I've done, by, I created this example by copying and pasting the information I had in my uh, Mongo example. And I just put insert into users values quotation mark in front of it. That's the only thing I've changed here. And then. With this data, after stored, PostgreSQL will parse this when you uh, send it to the database, store it in a binary format so that you can create indexes on it and do queries against all those different data types. All right, so now ha we have stored data. It's probably useful to have a look at how we can query for this data, because the database is pretty useless if you can't get the data out. Um, all right, so. With Redis, we already looked a little bit out, uh, at this, how we can do this, right? But you remember the, the example about the sets that you can use as is member 
to see whether a specific value is a member of a set, or you can get all of them back by S members. Similarly, for the hashes, there's an H get all to get all the key value combinations, and HM get to get only specific hash keys out of that. But there's a few other data types that allow for more specific query types. So L range and Z range allow you to ret retrieve a list of elements from a left position, the starting position in your array, to your right position, the end position in your array. And there's different variants. There's a sorted version where all the values are sorted already for you, so you don't have to do it yourself, or insert order. So that's the difference between the L and the Z here. Um, so you can do optimized queries against these very specific data types. Looking at MongoDB, MongoDB has a, a much richer a data query language. Uh, it, is, it, it, it isn't SQL, but it has nearly, or it has functionality that's on par with query uh, functionality from what you used to in SQL. But it looks very different. But um, once you look at it, it isn't actually that complicated. So this example is an example from the MongoDB shell, so I'm not doing this through PHP. But if you want to transfer this to how PHP does this, what you change is you add a dollar sign in front of DB, and you change the dots to an arrow. And then, of course, you don't type JSON. You use a PHP variable data structure, right? So the, it's not, I mean, the APIs are exactly the same. It's just a different language. So what we're doing here in this query, what we're finding is we're finding all the documents where region underscore slug equals Scotland Isla, and the rating is larger than three, or greater than or equal to three. These operations with a dollar sign are query operators. Uh, these are a... So because this is done as uh, in JavaScript syntax or PHP syntax, you don't build up a string to do queries. Like in an SQL query, they are all strings, right? I understand there's prepared queries where you can replace your question marks with values that are not being put in uh, as a string before it gets sent to the database. They're a different part of the protocol. But in general, you always have to build strings to interact with it by writing a skill query. So a, addition, a, a, a slight benefit here is by doing it in a declarative way is that it tends to be a bit harder to get like SQL or NoSQL injections because the values are just values instead of strings. Uh, so you don't have to think about escaping yourself and things like that. Uh, having said that, you can still get NoSQL injections by doing queries that you not sh uh, shouldn't do. So all the, um, all the requirements are for, um, for dealing with your input data correctly still hold true for NoSQL databases too. All right, so the query here is refining all the documents where region is Scotland Isla and the rating is larger than three or larger than greater than three. And we only want the fields back that are called whiskey, rating, and H. And pretty makes it look nicely instead of picking it out of on string. So um, we have this equality match. We have this match with a query operator. And then we have the projection. And a projection is you list basically all the fields that in SQL you do select star, but instead of the star you now have <coughs> Sorry again. <coughs> oh, whiskey rating and H. Sorry? Okay, that's a good question. <coughs> because the projection, you, because it is Java syntax, you can't just have a single word. It's a hash, right? So you need to have a key and a value. Now, the key here is the name of the field. The value is either one or zero. If it's one, it means included. If it's zero, it means excluded. So you can, you can either include fields that you want, or you can exclude some fields that you don't want. Uh, that's for the both different things. So <coughs> if there's some water, that'd be great. Um, ah, ah, you saw it coming up. Thank you very much. All right, so if I rewrite this query in SQL, you get a query like this, right? You get select whiskey rating H from check-ins, uh, where regions like you equals Scotland Isla, and then the rating is larger or equals to three. All right, so an additional way of doing queries in MongoDB is, called, is the aggregation framework. And the aggregation framework is a set of operations that you define that are run in order on a collection or a table. 
So what aggregate does, it, we've defined two operations here, this match and group. So the match stage, <coughs> sorry. In the match stage, what we're now matching is not a specific value, but we're using a value prefix. So it allows you to use regular expressions, um, which you anchor with a caret to the start of the string. You need to do that, otherwise it doesn't make use of an index. In a similar way as if in SQL you use find, oh sorry, select blah blah from table, where field like something. If you don't have, if you have the percent at the start of that string, it can also not make use of an index because the ways how strings are indexed are usually, you can only do that when they're anchored to the start of the string. In any case, what I'm trying to find is all the whiskeys where the region is in Scotland. Other countries also make whiskey. So that's what we're doing, this is match. And then the second step, the group stage, we then group all the, all the things that we found after the first step, we group them by region, and then create a list of all the whiskeys that we find by this region and put that in the whiskey field. This looks kind of complicated. Um, if you want to know more about how the aggregation framework works, come talk to me later. I'm going to run out of time if I go in there too deep. So for each of the matched documents, we're creating this bucket called in, indexed by the region name and then be adding uh, the data to it. So the result of this query would be something like this. Uh, I prettify this a little bit because the ID, the, the region slug has gone, but the ID value is now the name of the, of the region itself. But you can see that the result of this is an array of all the different whiskeys. So you can do quite a bit richer queries with this that you, you well, you can't do in SQL, right? Because in SQL, you usually, traditionally, you can't return a value that is an array of values. Of course, unless you use the JSONB data type from Postgres. All right, so queries with uh, the JSONB data type in Postgres, or HTOR in this case, are by using uh, specific extra SQL operators. Um, I don't necessarily remember the names of these operators because they have funny names, and yeah, I just don't remember the names of them. So in this example, we have a document with four fields. We have ID, location, count, unique, and is admin. To get the value for a key, you see that we use this error operator. And the error operator basically says, give me the field is admin for the field hdoc. And hdoc was the name that from the previous examples. So that will basically uh, give me for every document in users uh, the is admin flag. And the only thing is output. It's pretty useless, but uh, this is an example here. So what you can also do is you can use normal SQL operators on these fields as well. So in the second example here is that we're going to show all the underscore D values for all the users where the field count unique is larger than 10. So basically what it says, users that have logged in more than 10 times. And then for those, we want the underscore D values which is the unique identifier for a user. Now, because, of course, up front you never know which fields and values you have, it is also possible to find out whether those fields actually exist in the data. Uh, so in this case, the third example here, where we do select hdoc, question mark h, basically says, um, if this field exists, return, uh, return boolean through, I think it actually does. So you can text, so you can test for keys existing, which is, well, you sometimes need to know that, right? And then in the last example, which is probably the most unstandard SQL that I've seen in a while, you can use hdoc, the name of the field, and then we can check by this m% greater than sign, where the key value per location London UK, notice the double quotes around the key and the value, and the single quotes around the whole thing, which we need to cast as an h store, which is the colon, colon, h store in the end. Basically what this does is it selects all the documents and users where there's a, a field in the hdoc, sorry, where there is a key value combination in the hdoc field that matches location London UK. That is what it says. This gets more complicated, I think. 
uh, it doesn't look as nice, in my opinion, as how no skull databases do this because their query language is made to do this kind of thing, whereas SQL sort of has this bolted on. And I'm also not entirely sure of the standardization process of these additional operators. I know people are trying to standardize what all these things mean, but if it's new technology and databases, implement them in a slightly different way is kind of hairy. Uh, from what I know, both MySQL and PostgreSQL do implement those same data types. Uh, so that's for HStore. If you look at JSONB, it is similar. You can have both the arrow as well as the double arrow. And the double arrow is a little bit better because instead of returning uh, a string with a value in it, it will actually pull the data out of the string and return it as a normal data type. So most often people use the dash arrow arrow instead of the dash arrow operator. Um, and by doing this kind of queries, it becomes important what kind of indexes you use. Now normally what you have on a index field, uh, if you do normal create index, you create a B3 index. You get a B3 index on, a, on, on field and values. In order to do this kind of queries to make it go fast without having to scan the whole table, um, you have to create an index on hdoc email. So PostgreSQL knows if there's an, is a JSONB data type, you can actually set an index on subfields in there without you having to do anything about that. So in this case, you, just like you normally would have an index on email, you now have an, uh, an index on the email field inside this JSONB data type. Um, all right, so we again find the ID for the email address, which is my email address. Um, second example, uh, we're finding, we're now using the is not null um, SQL operator. Operator, is that how you call it? Let's call them operator. Uh, which is the same thing as you, how you otherwise would do it, if to check whether this value is null or not, which you can also use uh, to see whether the field actually exists because a non-existing field has a value of null in this case. Now then in the third example, we're going to be more complicated and we're using this at greater than operator to find out whether there's a word, uh, the word London, whether that is part of the array associated with the words field. Okay, this is a bit complicated. So as you see the words field here has four values. The query that we do here is a subset of this because it only matches words London, which is a subset of the document, and hence will then return it as a result. If I would have used words Paris, for example, because it doesn't match, it wouldn't return it. Additionally, if I would have done words London, comma, UK, it would also find it because it's still a subset of this document. In order to do this kind of queries, um, PostgreSQL recommends that you use a GIN index, and a GIN stands for uh, the G. Um, sorry, because my generative index, something like that. Generative inverted index. Basically, it's an index type that allows you to map multiple values to a single uh, single document. Sorry, single record. Um, which is a way of basically indexing all the key and values in this JSONB data type in one bucket, so you can do queries against that in one go without having to um, do it on specific fields, like we do for in the first example here, where we look specifically at data against the email field in the HDOC field. I know I'm using the same word a lot over and over again. It gets confusing after a while. Um, so just in the last example, what I want to show is that how would you update or add a field? I already mentioned when we looked at Redis before that it is important to use atomic operators to do operations on your data. What you don't want to do is retrieve the record in your application, then add an extra field to the hdoc type, which in order to do that, you basically have to rewrite a string. Not ideal way of doing that. So what PostgreSQL allows you to do is actually update or add fields by using the colon, not the pipe, pipe operator, which basically adds a field value combination country Europe. That's not a country, sorry. <laughs> uh, or if you want to remove a field, you can use minus instead of pipe, pipe. Okay, I'm going to have to 
change that country to either continent or change the name of the country for Europe to something else. All right. Um, all right. So that's the interaction with uh, with the different data types. So a bit a bit more about indexes. So indexes and redis, they're only going to be on your primary key. Um, if you want to do more, if you want to have a compound index, as I've shown you before, you used to. to it is a um, a preference to use the colon. There's no there's no hard requirement for using the colon, but this is what people tend to do. But some of the data structures provide additional indexes, right? If you have a set, for example, even though your primary key is still the first one, there's still sort of index on the value because it knows not to add multiple. Uh, multiple the same values to the set. So there's some indexing going in there. So, and similarly, if you have like a, a sorted list or something, it also does that kind of additional indexing to make the queries be faster without you having specifically having to create an index. It is part of the data type that you are using for storing the data, which is kind of handy. So in MongoDB indexes, uh, they are on normal fields, as you'd expect. Um, you can set unique keys. You can set indexes. Uh, so I have this one. You can set indexes on a nested field, like if you remember from the Postgres for example, where we had hdoc arrow email. You set an index on the email field with inside hdoc, which is what MongoDB uses with the dot instead of the arrow. Um, and you can set an index on words on the field words. The field words will now have multiple values associated with that field. Unlike PostgreSQL, which allows you to do this on the whole data type only, in MongoDB you can do this on specific fields inside the documents that you store. So it's a little bit more um, precise on what you store your indexes on, making it, of course, uh, if you be more precise with your index, you end up storing indexes of a smaller size because you have to store fewer information there or less information in there. So PostgreSQL has this gin index. Oh, the contrast really doesn't work here. Apologies. Uh, then again, picking red and blue on purple. <laughs> you should have seen that coming. But this gin index is a really quick way of creating this index on all the data inside an H store. And it is, you're going to have to do something in order to not have a uh, table scan. And so, yeah, so there are two types for JSON B fields there is a KV or just a V, key value or just a value. Uh, I think in general people will use um, uh, the standard, which is key value, and it allows you to map multiple values to a single document. So in this case, all the, the combination like name Glenn 25 or slug Glenn Albin or words Glenn words Albin and words 25 that will all show up in this index, so that you can quickly relate to a single record that contours that information in this data type. So with this, as I showed you before. Um, you can do these key value matches. So we're creating the index here with this using gin on properties. So you don't have to specify which type of index you use for it. If you want to create a B3 index, you don't have to specify the gin uh, thing. Um, so it, it will then index this whole, uh, uh, whole properties field. And similarly, it, this index is also used when you do this array containing a match, right? So, um, so we create the index. So we create the index on properties word, so that is a more specific type of index to then be able to match the properties to see whether, in this case with the question mark, we're trying to find whether the value album actually matches inside the words field. I've shown you only very simple operations you can do on this data. Uh, I mean, I can probably give it all that last several hours on all the different operations that you can do with this data. But again, not having the time for that. So, we'll get a gong here. Uh, a few more words about manipulating data. So, I've already mentioned this a few times. The way how you interact with data, you need to make sure that you do this in an atomic way. Uh, you can do this either with transactions, or you can make use of all the operations that work on all the specific data types, but it's always going to be your preferred way of doing it. Um, so that's the atomicity. So you shouldn't do retrieve, manipulate, and store. This is true for any database interaction you ever have with any database you can think of. So this should not be anything new. 
So Redis has a bit of extra operations here that allows you to work on things that you've already stored. So remember that we have the, uh, in Redis we have the properties, and in this case the property for h is 19, returned as a string. But you can do inc or h inc, they get difficult to pronounce those operations, h inc b, yeah, is that how you pronounce it? I don't know, they need to come up with something slightly better there I think. But what it does allow you to do is take the field and then use a value that you want to add to the field. So even though it is stored as a string, you can still do numerical operations to strings that look like numbers. And because it's an atomic operation, it's also really fast. It happens in place uh, and is basically a free thing to do. Uh, well, nothing is ever free, but it's just a really fast operation. Um, and this is used in many applications where you keep counters, like visitor counters, or, or anything like that, or uh, if anybody still uses Foursquare, like how many people have checked into a specific venue, right? All the kind of things. Um, Redis is a really good database for doing this for. Also, if you lose the data, it's kind of annoying, but you cannot, should always be able to build it back from data you've already stored on disk. Um, and then there's other things, like the atomic operational sets I already spoke about, is as add, adding elements to set, or R, as rem from removing them and so on. And then there's transactions, as you saw. So in MongoDB, a similar thing, never do this. Never do a query, update your value, and then store it again. You get race conditions. And MongoDB has operations uh, starting with a dollar sign, which if you're using PHP is kind of annoying because you really need to make sure you're not using double quotes. You need to use single quotes for everything. Otherwise, you get weird results. And in this case, what this query says in the first example, it says, increment the subfield 2017-0202 in the field steps underscore mate and increase it by 7,124. Um, as a atomic operation, it's kind of handy. It also has operations for sets. Uh, although MongoDB doesn't have a set data type per se, there are operations in the query language that allow you to deal with specific arrays as they were sets by using these operations. So add to sets basically says, add the word open stream map to tags, unless it's already there, and then just ignore the operation. Similarly, you can you do things like push to push things to the end of an array. And you remember that in Postgres, so you could do that with a pipe pipe operator right, to add an extra field to it. Similarly, MongoDB allows you to say push tag. So what we're doing here is that we're adding to the tags property the values MongoDB and xDebug. And then after we've done that, we only take the last two elements and everything else that we discard. Okay, in this example, that is kind of silly because we've just added two elements and then we only keep the last two elements that we have. But what you can use this for is that you add a comment to a blog post and then by using slice minus 10, you make sure that you only store the last 10 comments with a specific blog post. And this is all one single operation without you from an application having to create transactions and do this kind of thing. So, um, as I said, all those NoSQL databases as well as Postgres or the JSONB data type have these operations that you really want to use. Okay, schema validation. In a relational database, well, there's schema validation because you have to create a schema up front, right? But with all those uh, extra modern data types now, you don't describe the schema of, these, of the data that you store in there up front. Um, in, relational, in the relational database with these data types, you generally cannot enforce a schema on the data that you store in there. It is really translated, uh, treated as a bucket of data. But of course, the things that you want to enforce uh, the structure of, you wouldn't store in this JSONB data type anyway, you would store that as normal fields in your, uh, in your record. With NoSQL databases, it isn't generally possible to enforce a schema, although the database have been adding um, functionality to this. I can't remember whether CouchDB has anything for it, but MongoDB allows you, for example, to set up a validator. And a validator is basically a way of running a query against a document after it's been updated or inserted to see whether it matches a specific query, the validator, and if it matches, if, it, if the document would be found by running this query, 
it, it's considered being validated. So this is a way of enforcing a schema by, not by still not having to create a schema up front, for example. So that is a possible thing to do. I think the latest version of MongoDB actually extends this language to JSON schema. So if you use that, uh, it is a lot richer than what MongoDB originally had before JSON schema existed, for example. All right, so conclusions. The way how you store non-scalar data on different databases it varies wildly. Um, it's important to pick the right tool for the job, right? I would usually recommend people use Redis for this very quick in-memory operations uh, because it's really good at that. But Redis isn't particularly very good at scaling it beyond a single machine. Um, a relational database, such as Postgres with a JSONB data type or MySQL with its JSON type, which is also getting better and better over time. Um, if you're already having an application using a relational database and you need to store some extra unstructured data that doesn't happen very often, then use a relational database and use the JSONB or JSON types as additional, to store additional information. If your application is already either highly unstructured, some data is just like that, using a NoSQL database like CouchDB or Elasticsearch or, or MongoDB is the right tool for the job there, right? Because it's already architected in such a way. In addition, most NoSQL solutions are also built to be run on a distributed platform. So if you need to have easier failover capabilities or distributed writes and reads and things like that, relational databases tend to be <coughs> less good for that because they have not been architected for that, right? They are 30, 40 years old where the way how you scale your database is you get a bigger machine most of the time. And then there are some data types that work better with some databases, like having the sets. It's probably, a, a Redis would be a much more natural fit for that than you do that in a relational database or even in a document database. So those are the different things that you need to look at. Uh, many different possibilities. There, as I said, Wikipedia lists 57 different types of NoSQL databases. Um, <coughs> um, others with more um, exotic features than others. Um, so yeah, if you have things that you don't think that fits with the things I've just spoken about today, uh, have a look at what else is out there, and there's a lot of different things out there. Having said that, are there any queries? We have two minutes. There's one right up front here. Use the mic, please. Would you uh, recommend any of these for storing uh, events if you're using libraries such as Broadway for or go into the complexity of a dedicated event store? So when you say event store, you, you don't mean time series data, right? Is, is it just events for everything that happens through your application and you want to store in a big log, basically? Do you yeah. see that right? Yes, so something like an event-driven architecture where you have right. your domain events. I don't think it particularly matters much. The, but what you need to look, I don't think I'd use Redis for it because Redis is not good as a system of record. Neither is Elasticsearch in this case. Um, both relational databases, as well as, say, CouchDB or MongoDB as NoSQL data, so it would be perfect fit for that, right? I mean, at the, that point, you just need to start figuring out, I need to, you need to run some benchmarks. What is the fastest data store for you? Or uh, similarly, good point about thinking about which one to use, which one that I'm most familiar with, or do I really fancy playing with something else and figuring out how, how that works for me, right? So these are the concerns there, but because in the event store itself, they don't really have unstructured data very much, it doesn't particularly matter, in my opinion. Anything else? No questions? Oh, right here in front again. Uh, I've not uh, implemented or used a NoSQL database before, but we, were, we had a pro technical problem which we are trying to solve using NoSQL, but mm -hmm. I wanted to know, for example, the way NoSQL works is that there's no definite schema, so one JSON object might differ from other JSON objects. For example, yep. one JSON object might have field called name, the other one might not. Mm -hmm. So is there is, is possible to have an index on the key called name and then tell the NoSQL database that if you find this key called name, index it, and then I, I want to pull out everything um, which has that name. And then if it doesn't have it, ignore it. Um, yes, so um, 
CouchDB handles that in a different way because you need to create different story. For MongoDB, I, I know you can create an index on a field okay. and you can create a sparse index on this field, which means that any documents where this field doesn't exist just don't show up in your index. Okay. Um, or you can make a non-sparse index where the fields will show up but the value will be null. So that's yeah, nice. that Thank should you. be possible there. Right, anything else? One right here, and then I've, be, I've run over time. So this is going to be the last one. Uh, hey there. Uh, so I noticed at the beginning of the talk you said there's four database types, uh, yes. but you only mentioned three from what I've Gr got. Graph databases of. is the one I missed. Ah, cool. Yes. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I realized that later during the talk, oh, I meant, forgot to mention graph databases, but there's always an eagle. No eared person in the front row, right? You're forgiven. <laughs> yes, yes, graph databases, the other big type. Big type. All right, uh, one more slide. QR codes, who doesn't love QR codes? Uh, the QR code will go to my, uh, my, um, my website where uh, you can download the slides of this presentation. It also has a list of resources if you want to do a little bit more reading. Uh, if you have further questions, come and find me at a conference. Uh, email me. I'm getting better at answering emails. Um, no, that's no loss. I'm getting better at doing that. Uh, having said that, thank you very much.